The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, guys, and welcome to our first webinar ever for the mentoring committee for the Florida Bandmaster Association. Woohoo! Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm probably, I think, showing up as like a little corner in your box. And this handsome gentleman next to me is Jim Sammons, our guest tonight. So um, we have a couple of people here in the room. I'm going to turn the camera around so maybe you can see them. That's uh, Ian Crumpton. He's our host. That's Luke Hall. He organized this throughout our district. And that's Mr. Laban. He is a band director in District 13. So um, we do have some people here live. Um, but uh, you can also uh, log in or um, on your screen, there should be a spot for questions or chat. Mr. Hall is monitoring for chat. Okay, so um, you should have this already because you are here. But here's the link. Um, it's also on the Facebook page. If somebody's texting you because they're dying to get on, but they can't, just tell them to go to the Facebook page that the link is fresh. So um, we, um, Dr. Chapman and I at FAU, were talking about things that we could do to really help directors spark some conversation and like, you know, we're young enough that technology was a thing. So Mr. Sammons agreed to help us hear that because at this time of the year, we feel like one of the most important things to talk about is picking good music for MPA, beginning with the end of mind. So what we're really talking about today is your classroom practice, is assessment, is everything that leads up to the most successful concert MPA performance that you can have. We know our programs don't live and die on that MPA performance, but boy, are they sure a good barometer and a good goal for us to uh, achieve. So I'm not gonna do a lot of talking from this point on because Mr. Sure. Sammons is our learned guest. He is the retired band director from Vero Beach High School. He is an FBA past president, as well as a Hall of Fame member, and he's a life member of the Florida Band Masters Association. He is an, a member of the American Band Masters Association, and he earned 30 years of consecutive superior ratings at state MPA. So as we go along, like I said, Mr. Hall is monitoring questions for us. Um, we might hold some stuff to the end, but if there's like, wait, 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 I really wanna ask another question, just type it on in and he'll throw something at us to get our attention. So here we go. Okay, well, it's good to be with you all. Um, <clears throat> we made some assumptions um, coming into this presentation uh, to find a starting place. And you'll see on the screen some things that, that we <clears throat> are assuming that are at, under control right now in your band room, or they're under well underway uh, in, in developing these skills. Um, always the question is, does the band sound good? You know, it's a simple question, yes or no. If the answer is yes, well, why does it sound good? If the answer is no, well, why doesn't it? And then always the, the big problem there is, well, how do I fix it if it does not? And what do I do to position myself and my students in the position to be uh, very successful with these things? So we start with sound fundamentals. The most important thing is a solid characteristic tone. And that has to do, as you know, with many different, different aspects, but air support is the first ingredient. And again, I'm assuming you have a, a workable instrument with a appropriate mouthpiece reed, um, whatever it is to, is needed to make that uh, instrument play properly. So then it's a matter of putting the air into the horn to support a characteristic tone. And of course that's supported, you know, with a appropriate embouchure, all the things that go into breathing, such as posture, uh, use of the diaphragm, how much air to take in, those, those sort of things. We're assuming those are, are pretty well in place and that your students are um, on, on the pathway or already demonstrating a good characteristic tone. <clears throat> the next element after that is holding steady pitch. Take that beautiful characteristic tone and center the pitch. Um, and again, that has to do with the air, number one, 
and the embouchure number two does the horn mechanically work. So these are very, very related to each other. Um, but the student should be able to hold a steady pitch. They should be able to match a drone sound. Um, they should be able to take an electronic tuner and, and, and you know zero the sound or bring it up. Um, and they should be able to play pretty well centered throughout the average range of their instrument. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming <coughs> we're talking to both middle school and high school directors this evening. And so those ranges will be adjusted uh, across what's appropriate for your age group, what's appropriate for the um, for the experience level of your ensemble. And then we're assuming technical skills that are appropriate for the grade of music that you're going to play. Um, and again, you're you probably have been looking at some anywhere from grade grade twos uh, on up to the more advanced grade grade fives or sixes. And you've probably extracted some fundamentals, or hopefully you've extracted some fundamental things that have to do with the you know, technical passages, uh, and have been been using those, uh, drilling those as uh, exercises, and just kind of preparing those technical skills for the average <coughs> two grade two piece through the average grade five or six piece, and you're using that as part of your you know daily um, skills development. Um, <clears throat> along with that goes articulation and style. Again, the same thing. Uh, are you looking at your performance literature or your potential literature and going, okay, what are the um, stylistic requirements here? What, what, uh, what kinds of articulation are we going to have to do? How are we going to interpret these things? And again, extracting those from your um, performance literature, I, su I suppose, lots of assumptions here this evening, but that we're either in preparation for our winter concert, uh, we have had a fall concert, and so maybe we're doing both. Uh, most <clears throat> high school directors are coming off the marching MPA. Um, so we've had some, you know, perhaps some assessments and we've had some performance literature and you're extracting those markings and those interpretive uh, aspects, again, into some sort of daily warm up. And, and, and preparation uh, for playing on that grade of music. Same thing with dy dynamics, the same thing with, with rhythms, um, same thing with phrasing. And, and that's, that starts at the individual level. And then of course, we're applying that into your ensemble and understanding you know, that, that we go from the individual to the section, to the voice group, to the full ensemble, applying all these kinds of things. Another assumption over on the, the, the my right hand side as I look at the screen the band ensemble skills understanding and, and, and practicing rehearsal etiquette um, my experience is that the the better groups that I've heard my better groups uh, during the career have been those groups that had procedures uh, we, we had a procedure uh, or a system for everything from coming in the door getting the horns out, sitting down, individual warm-up, we had all of those kind of systems in place to, to, to set the tone for an effective rehearsal. And then, you know, during the course of our warm-up and our curricular part of rehearsal, uh, we've dealt with now group intonation, melod both melodic lines, unison lines, but also starting to understand the harmonic structure. Is it, is it a major chord? Is it a minor chord? Does it involve sevens or nines or just whatever it might be? Are we teaching you know, the students to tune and balance those chords and things harmonically? And then we are making sure that everyone understands balance and blend. They're very related to each other. Um, I always started with the, with the blend idea of taking, uh, for example, if I've got five flutes sitting on the front row, then I try to get them to, to match each other horizontally and melt into each other's sound. After that, I might take a uh, melody or a line, and if it's in the clarinet section, then I would balance the flute with the clarinet so that we get the right mix of the two. So you get, you get the gist of what the balance and blend thing's about. And then, of course, the ensemble is, is working on dynamics, um, grouping notes into, into you know, logical lines and phrases, uh, understanding 
nuance, that subtleties of what nuance is about. And we'll probably get into that a little bit later on. Responding to you as the conductor, response to your baton. What, what are you showing the kids and are they responding to it? Doesn't have to be fancy, it just has to be uh, plain and, and you know very, very functional uh, so that they understand that you start the sound, you change the sound, you change the speed at which they're playing the tempo, you stop the sound, you slow the sound down, all those things that we do, you know, to communicate uh, those basic things. And then, of course, hopefully by now you've played some um, developing marches, um, some songs, ballads, lyrical pieces, uh, read through a couple of overtures, uh, longer pieces, and, and kids are starting to understand uh, the variety of style. What's the difference between a march style and say perhaps a, a uh, Holtz style lyrical piece or a Bach chorale, just differences between styles. So that's where, hopefully that's where we are. We're in the second, second week of November. And again, hopefully you've got the starting place ready to go. If, if not, well, that's another webinar, another clinic down the road. Um, so we're gonna give Mr. Sams a second to take a drink of water here. So that we, that we spent a lot of time on that screen. So if you're sitting there and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm not sure where I am. These are some ways you can assess your current situation. Go to your marching band MPA forms if you just went to marching MPA. What did the judges say? What did they not say? Look at those quickly. If you did a fall concert, if you have one coming up, look at those as assessments for all those things of where we are. This isn't a we're great or we stink. Look at it as an assessment. What are you evaluating? Um, what are you thinking about as you start looking for literature? Um, do you have auditions after marching band season? If you have auditions after marching band season, boy, won't that tell you a lot about where your students are as individual musicians. That's data you're collecting based for the music that you're gonna pick. Um, arranging an assessment. If you haven't had a fall assessment, um, perform a concert anyways. It can be, uh, you know, have somebody come in and say, look, we're gonna run three tunes for you that we're gonna do for our holiday concert. Will you come in and listen and make some notes for me before I make those final decisions? You know, then what are you assessing? And this is really, you know, a part of it, the heart of what we're talking about. You have to be doing an assessment. If you looked at that first um, slide and you're like, oh, holy moly, you know, we're not there on any of that. There is no there. It's where are you on these skills, okay? There is no end point on these skills. So you just have to assess where you are. Look at the individual, look at the small group, your sections, your choirs, look at your large group, look at all those things, but you have to, if you didn't attend, you know, Marching MPA is a great tool for this. Um, listen to your music judges scores. Remember how the level of your music is gonna differ from your concert band music. That's a really good place to start. Think about what you have um, as far as potential soloists, your color and sprints and your percussion. But by this stage of the game, we can't talk about picking music if you don't have a good understanding of your ensembles. Not are they good kids or bad kids, okay? What, you gotta get in there and, and get a little bit dirty. Before you go on, can I add a couple of things, Casey? I was thinking about, especially for our high school directors just coming off of marching MPAs, it says differences between marching and concert. Well, those are those are kind of, we're not talking about visual differences and the fact that you use maybe maybe bell front uh, French horns or such as that. <clears throat> but the differences in the, the ensemble sound, there are many similarities. But one of the one of the things we have to be careful about is a, as a pretty active adjudicator of concert bands and marching bands, um, I've noticed that, and especially this time of year, it's hard to keep the marching sound from becoming the indoor sound. And sometimes I've heard some groups in the spring that are still, you know, they have their big toe still that outdoor sound. So you wanna be very careful that as you make your sound for the fall, for the winter concert and in the early uh, weeks of January, that you adapt your concert band sound to the indoors and realize the differences uh, between the two, besides those that are really obvious. Um, all right, Casey, okay, you want to awesome. go on to another one? All right, so now that we have gotten kind of this, this baseline, 
where you need to be heading. You don't have to be, don't panic if you're not there right now at, you know, 6.15 on, you know, Wednesday night. You have to be considering these things before we can go on. Now that you have a solid understanding of your ensemble skills, now you can really begin to prepare. And a lot, a lot of that's going, going to be uh, based on where you think your, your band is, as, as Casey just said. Uh, backing up just one final thought, a lot of us will have a, a concert coming up in the next month or so. That's the, last, that's the last assessment you have before you really have to make some serious decisions. Maybe you've already made some decisions, and, and I hope you're in a position to have made some, like what's my march going to be, or what's my second selection going to be, hopefully. But one word, another word of caution, a lot of the basic fundamentals, be they, they good or okay or faulty on the winter concert, that's pretty much the band you're gonna to have to live with until March or April, depending if it's high school or middle school MPA. So a good recording of that is your last gut check for reality. And those, those fuzzy wuzzy clarinet sounds are not likely to get that much better by March, so, you know, plan according. Awesome. Oh, and that, that segues really well into our second line yeah. there. Yeah. Be realistic. Absolutely. Um, so, at this, po at this point, perhaps you are now looking at some definite pieces and you're studying them, looking at them. So, I would say when you're looking at the score, break down, break, break the thing down into my, my, the technical ability of my kids, and, and you can put a lot of stuff under there, like range, can, can they rip scales, or do they not know scales? Um, do, they, do they blend and balance chords well? Do they understand harmonics, harmonic tuning, and that sort of thing? Um, assess those things, and make sure that, it, that you've located your weaknesses, and you have a plan to fix those things as we begin to apply them in, in, you know, directly into the music. Perhaps they've already been extracted from the music. Another thing to consider, and, and this one is a big one, is that you understand your school calendar and you understand how much rehearsal time is actually available, that you prepare kind of a pacing calendar. I want to be, you know, at this point in this piece of music at a certain date. Um, maybe, maybe you've divided the, the, the march into, into three parts, your, your first strain, may, maybe your trio and your break strain, or whatever, how the march lays out or in thirds. Maybe you divided the other two tunes into five parts and you're gonna work five chunks or, or whatever. Number them, label them, name them, whatever you're going to do, and start to put on a realistic calendar of when you want those things uh, ready to go. The other thing is plan on, no matter how many days you count out, let's say you figure, hey, I got a 40-day countdown to MPA. Well, you know that something's going to happen. There's going to be some, you know, unplanned assembly, some weather event that you're going to lose a day or two. Somebody's going to have this great idea for a wonderful guest speaker, and we're just going to take your band period to speak to the school. And I can go on and on about that. I mean, the, the school is full of time robbers, you know, and, of course, everybody's protected of their turf. So be very realistic about the actual days you have. Then, then be realistic, I think, about the hours and minutes you have. And understand that you're going to take some time out for warm up. You gotta take some time out for you know, the business of the band. So out of 50 minutes, you may only realistic, you can plan on 40 hard focused minutes, or in some cases, 35. And so just get real realist, realistic about that. Look for field trips, look for testing, anything that's going to interrupt your plan before you make the plan and plan for those interruptions. Also, I think you have to really understand the, the culture of your, your students, your ensemble's culture. And by that is, what's their buy-in? Have, have they bought into the procedures of coming into the room diligently, urgently getting their horns out, getting all their stuff, you know, do they sit down like ready to go? You know, I mean, it's like rehearsal. Yes, it's a, it's a huge priority. Or do they still get up four or five times and go get something they forgot? Those kind of things. So understand their work ethic, um, you know, and honestly, when you pick pieces, 
make sure you're committed to doing what it takes to get those pieces ready to go. And you may say, well, my band's just playing grade two. I ain't got to worry about that. Well, look, the simpler it is, the more exposed it is, and the more adjudicator can pick it apart. So that argument's out the door. Um, some of the hardest pieces you know, are, are whole notes, half notes, and quarter note pieces. And uh, they, can, they can tear a unprepared band up. But again, your, your realistic commitment to your rehearsal time, do you have enough time for these pieces? Plan that rehearsal time, and then you have to understand and know your score. You have to know what it is you're going to, to, to be looking at and understand the music. And I'm gonna push through a couple of things real quick, but here's something that's not on the list. You need, as the director, you need to know what it is you want from your band. What do you want it to sound like? What do you want it to, to play like in terms of precision? So you need to figure out what it is that you want. And so this, and again, hopefully you're, this is making sense uh, to you as well. But so now that you've made a lot of these decisions beforehand, how is your classroom practice going to affect this? And this, again, this is what Jim was talking about. You know, you have to have that backward design. You know, I really like what he said about breaking your selections up into sections and in nice digestible parts. You know, how do we eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You know, it's not, it's MPA. No, it's a march with three sections. It's an overture with three sections. It's a suite with five sections. You can really digest it that way. You know, what do your daily rehearsals look like? What maybe needs to change based on what's going on in your classroom? It's the second week of November. You know, um, I'm a proponent of we can start over anytime we want. We have Thanksgiving break coming up. And if you're like, you know what? My classroom plan and the way things operate is not going to help me be successful in March. Well, then you need to start that over because you're not going to be able to have the musical success you want if your classroom practice isn't what you want. Okay. Um, you know, Mr. Sams and I had the opportunity to you know, talk about this a lot, which was, you know, a blessing for me for sure. But, you know, we talked a lot about how directors use the term, I know my kids can play it. Okay. But do you know that this music can be learned by the group in this setting? Those are two different questions. Okay. So these are things that you have to have in your daily rehearsal. Um, Jim already spoke to you know, being regimented, you know, the warm up skill development, you know, and so this is just a really quick rehearsal plan. Jim, are there any things you want to talk about on the plan you know, quickly before we you know, move on? Well, just just to remind people that, that warm up is not just, you know, physically warming the instruments up to playing temperature. I Part B of that is, you know, it says skill development. That's where I'm going to develop the skills in those chunks of MPA music that the kids are going to have to, to be able to do. Um, so just remember, part of rehearsal is extraction of the problem spots. Hopefully you can predict, know your kids well enough that you can look at a letter C, you know, the flute's going to have trouble with that. And you preempt that, you know, in, in part B of your warm up and, you, and as part of your skill development. All right. If your warm up is not leading to your rehearsal, you're wasting everybody's time. Okay, and they're a lot younger than you are, so you, you know they they're willing to waste time. All right, so you have to use your time wisely because so you make sure that your warm up is really connected to what you want your literature um, to produce and what you want your students to understand. <clears throat> well, rehearsals, and you know these are these are some things. Um, I was speaking with a, with a a colleague a few days ago, and. You know, the, everybody is overloaded, overworked, overwhelmed with, and bombarded with all the things that we have to deal with in the course of a school day. You know, the, the need, 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 want, want, want from constant administrators, parents, kids, community, those kind of things. And it can be overwhelming. And so I did some thinking about, well, okay, what would be a quick rehearsal plan? And these things that are listed, I'm not going to expound on each one of them because you can you can see it. But what I would suggest that you do, you know, um, include include some of these in your your warm up, and really 
the the point of of the warm up portion is to establish the sound that you want your band to sound like, and you have to you have to have that sound in your ears, whether you get it from a, from a colleague's band, or you get it from recordings, or you know you're looking at the score and your little uh, band in your brain is 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 you know sending you the message of what you want. Um, that one is is one that's there every day, I think, in rehearsal. Um, but pick one. If well, I don't know what to do today. Well, here's what you don't do. You don't say, well, gee whiz, I I came in late because the traffic was backed up, had a flat tire, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. And you got to get on that podium real quick. Um, just take a look at one of these things and and go with it. You know, once you warm up, just say, well, today we're going to work on all the faulty rhythms you know, in part three of my march. And just go after that one thing, clean that up. And if there's time, then say, okay, we've got the rhythm down and let's get the pulse and the tempo solid. Maybe another day you 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 heard some some notes and say, okay, today's gonna be bad note day, you know, and wide interval day. So you can just cherry pick these things and have an effective rehearsal. It's it's obviously better to have you know a a fairly sequential plan, but if you address each one of these fundamentals um, numerous times throughout your MPA prep, you're bound to be getting a lot of stuff right. So and um, also on your judges sheets, take a look at the three boxes on the judge sheet. That's a good lesson plan. Another colleague shared with me that um, they had just you know blown up the three boxes, and I think I've seen some boxes blown up in some band rooms around our area and just make a checklist from the judges sheet. Okay, today I worked on uh, interpretive articulation. Today I worked on shaping lines and just check off and see what boxes you're missing. Just double check yourself. And of course, there's the recording of rehearsals, uh, which will, you know, be very helpful if it doesn't, you know, drive you to go quit your job. You right. Um, and, you know, when, uh, as a uh, Jim was talking about characteristic tone and all this kind of stuff. Sometimes he said, was, you know, listening to the recordings. I'm a real proponent of listening to your band. And, and there is that time. I mean, my husband would always know that first day that I recorded when I got home because I was certainly a cranky mm -hmm. pants. But for me, it was when my band started sounding too good a little too soon. Because there are just certain things you can't hear. I also know for me, another trouble sign was when I was singing on the podium. Because if I'm singing on the podium, I'm not listening to what they're doing. Yeah, so so those are some things that, you know, you don't have to record your rehearsal and listen to all 55 minutes every day. But certainly when you're six weeks out, get to take take their temperature, you know, see, see where they are, see see what's going on where you are six weeks out because there's still time six weeks out, six days out, not so much. Okay. Uh, I mean, get, off, get off the podium and walk around the room, stand in the middle of the band. Again, that may drive you to go quit your job at the end of the day, <laughs> because we do have that podium blindness and we have podium deafness. And sometimes we get to the point, if something gets a little better, we're just like, yeah, let's have a parade, man. This just got better. And then we go on and then we come back and it's not, well, that good anymore. So be constantly just double checking yourself. I like what you said, Dr. Cronco, about the minute the band starts sounding good to me, I get worried. <laughs> I get worried and, and scared that we're missing something. So just double check yourselves. Yes, yeah, so we keep our glasses half empty. So the next thing we want to talk about is musicianship. You know, we, we use this as, you know, we're talking about MPA because, you know, there's a lot that rides on our assessment. You know, there it's valuable. It's not just a pride thing, but it certainly is. We're you know we're amongst friends here. We're not going to lie. You know, we take value in what our peers think about us. You know, but we are developing musicianship, and if we start thinking about that immediately, then it will really help us pick our literature because we want to develop young musicians so they can continue their development as they grow. Absolutely. Well, one of the <clears throat> things to consider in picking in picking the music. I mean, there's, there's obviously you're thinking, my gosh, there's like tons of things to consider. Yeah, you know, like everything, because um, everything affects everything apparently. But the the selection, you know, based on all of your, your ensemble strengths and weaknesses, you must consider the artistic 
uh, merit of the literature that you're going to pick and make sure that both you and the students can connect to the music or with good rehearsal, can, can, the, can the students be connectable to the music and, and, and vice versa? You know, one of the things we have to do in performance, our job is to capture the spirit and the intent of the music and the composer's intent. And if we can't figure out what that is, I wouldn't play that piece. You know, because if you don't get it, then they're not definitely not going to get it. Um, and, and so the areas of artistic growth, you know, for you to grow as the director, but then you, you have to pass that on to the kids. So one of the big rules of music selection, I think we have a good paper online in under the meeting, mentoring committee. I they so. pick your music, pick your rating. So right. we won't go into that too much. That's already out there. But <clears throat> we kind of came up with this idea that whatever you're going to play at this point in time, or certainly by winter concert time, that piece of music, you look at it, these are the fundamentals. 80% of those fundamentals are well on their way to development. You can see it happening in the next three months at MPA, um, and or they're under control right now and are only going to get better. About 80% of that, you know, and again, be be aware that the, that band you hear at winter break is pretty much that band you're taking the MPA. So don't over-program and, and vice versa, don't under-program either. But about 20% of a piece should be a challenge to them. And not like, if we're comfortable with grade three, we don't need to find some grade five challenges. You know, bump it up a notch and, and, and call it a day. You can always bump it up next year. And the reality check is, like I said, the winter concert's the band you're taking. And faulty things like trumpets that can't play above middle C, um, clarinets that are, sound like sandpaper, you know, on an, on an A or a B flat, um, that you're not going to fix those. And you have to just try to avoid them or hide them, you know, by, by skillfully picking. So just the reality check and keep that challenge to about 20% of the piece. I would like to, before we move on, direct something specifically for our middle school directors, especially those who have maybe second and third middle school bands or seventh grade bands and sixth grade bands. I would bristle a lot when I would hear people say, you know, artistic merit on a grade one piece of music with sixth graders. But because I wasn't thinking about how the students were thinking about this as artistic music. Um, I'm not sure if either of them are still on the list, but there used to be what we would call the ums, ceremony um and a period, you know, and the kids mm -hmm. just really, really dig those pieces of music. It's not my place to judge you know, their artistic merit in the sense of, you know, let's compare the ums to Brahms, you know, but for a sixth grader, for a seventh grader, what can I teach them about expressing in that style of music? Okay, there is room for lots of line. Okay, we're not talking artistic merit as in this going to be literature to, you know, last the ages. Artistic merit means different things depending on your band's level of development. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this as coming clean because I passed up a lot of music at times because I didn't understand what artistic merit meant. Is it done, is the phrasing done well? Okay, or do the lines make sense in terms with each other? Is it a good teaching piece for that next step? Okay, you know, we have a committee that puts a lot of time in on the music and it's hard to think about at that level because we're all professional musicians. But when you're thinking about artistic merit, you got to kind of channel that inner middle school kid and think how will this appeal to them in terms of, you know, melody? You know, what can we teach in terms of phrasing? What, what articulation styles can we teach them? So when we want them playing, you know, grade six music when they're, you know, a junior in high school, you know, to, to, to go through all the grades. Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of kids jumping from grade two music and, you know, eighth grade to grade five music in high school. Boy, there's a lot of good stuff there in the grade three and four range that has a lot of artistic yeah. merit that can really help develop their skills. I like what you said about cre creating your own merit. Because sometimes we all get in situations with bands that we have to play something more functional than perhaps we'd like to play. But we can shape lines that aren't necessarily shaped. 
And understand, composers expect us to make music out of this stuff. So sometimes these pieces are, are sparsely uh, marked with dynamics and things, but just create your, create your own ideas, you know, and, and some spontaneous cre creativity would be great. We, we both laughed the other day when we were have, having a meeting, putting this together, and uh, in, in both our lives, uh, Bill Miller, William, William Clayton Miller of Lakeland fame, um, impacted us, and, and <coughs> another whole clinic about the value of mentors. But um, he um, basically said, pick your music as if nobody's gonna practice at home. And I don't think I've found a band director um, in forever that wasn't complaining about how their kids didn't practice enough or even at all. And I'm, I'm saying to, to folks I work with, don't count on the kids. Don't okay. count on the kids. You know, if they help you, that's great, but don't count on the kids. Okay, so Casey put me on the spot about top Down seven. and dirty. Yeah. We got to get yeah, to here. You you get give me a it. list. So I gave, gave her the list of things. I don't know if they're in the particular order I might put them in, but certainly, you know, consider these things. Instrumentation by this point, and certainly by winter concert, that should be obvious. Okay. You don't want to give the... Um, for example, way way back yonder in a galaxy far away, so to speak, um, I decided to play a certain piece uh, because I wanted to play it. And well, we had it had it had an oboe solo in it, and I had this in my head: we'll get it. Well, we'll get it. It's not that hard. We'll just get it. Well, we didn't get it, and so I'll leave the rest up to your imagination. So don't put yourself in a, in a situation with a soloist that might get it. They have to they have to be a soloistic player that can handle the pressure with the beautiful tone and so forth. Can you cover your basic first, second, and third parts? Now, sometimes in developing ensembles, that may require cross cueing and and doubling in some things. But can you cover them adequately? I've heard a few bands at state with as as few as under twenty kids get a superior because they covered everything on the score that needed to be covered and they covered it with, with a nice sound and, and beautiful musical expression. And so it can be done. Uh, does this piece depend on color instruments? That depends on the scoring and the doubling. Um, color instruments are always important, but if they're gonna be exposed in the score, then you got to cover them. It's not a good idea you know, in most situations to have the trumpet stick a mute in and cover the oboe part, unless they broke their hand the day before, you know, less oboes and all that stuff. Uh, percussion parts, that's another thing. Well, we'll just leave out some of the percussion parts, okay? I know of a situation where a band was recording a piece, um, and this was a university ensemble, nameless to be sure, but they were preparing a piece and the composer was going to come in and direct, the, you know, conduct the piece. Well, one of the parts was missing, and no one caught the thought part that that part was not present. It was never passed out. It was never covered. Someone, aka the conductor, omitted that. It was buried at the bottom of the score in, you know, microscopic print. So in comes the composer, and guess what? The first thing they noticed was that part wasn't covered. So don't leave things out. If you don't have the instrumentation, don't play it, or it needs to be something that you can cover, even if you have to pull some flute players out or an over, extra saxophones to do a few things, just make sure you can cover them. Range, we've already covered that. Uh, technical skills, rhythm, melodic and harmonic challenges. That's that. Watch out for the harmonic challenges. If, you, if all your kids ever do is play, you know, the, 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 the harmony line in B flat, then, and you come up with, you know, um, all kinds of color chords, um, dissonant chords, you know, inverted this and that and the other that they've never seen before, that's a problem. You're never going to make this thing sound good. Stylistic things, you know, march has to sound like a march. A classical piece has to have a certain amount of lightness to it, et cetera. Programming, endurance. Don't pick a long program unless you've got a very advanced ensemble. The shorter, the better. And the judges don't mind if they're short pieces. We don't mind, what we mind is if, if they're good or not. 
but your warm-up march is simply that. That's not the time, unless you have a great ensemble, to play um, as yours truly did <coughs> one time, the march to the scaffold for a warm-up march. Okay, That was probably not a good idea, but I did have a couple of all-state clarinet players, a couple of all-state bassoon players, and we decided to show off. We didn't do it at state, but we did it. That's not a good idea to do that with a limited ensemble. And I would never do that again. That was back in the, in, in the less enlightened days. I would play something short to the point, thickly scored, so you can show off, you know, the the, the ensemble skills of your band. Multi movement movement works. Short ones are okay. Long ones might not be okay. But just consider those and contrasting selections. Tonalities, tempos, textures, orchestration. Try to make. Remember, this is a concert with three separate tunes, and they all need to complement each other. Hey, thanks, Jim. We're going to talk a little bit more about programming. This, you know, what we could talk about is as varied and broad as the you know, number of students in our bands. So uh, Jim's going to talk to give you a few pointers on things to consider when selecting your, your music. It's not just, can we play this? You got to think about what components of it. That, that to me is where you know, directors get in trouble the most. They look at the score. Oh, we did this when I was in high school, and this band is as good as we were when I was in high school. Well, you were 17 when you're in high school. You have a college degree now, and you're looking at the world a little differently. So you might need to think about these components. You know, that's what we're thinking about now. So this is, you know, just things to consider. Absolutely. Well, the, 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 first of all, the purpose of the warm-up march is to warm up the band to the hall, to get the band to, uh, used to the acoustics of the hall. Again, it's not a time to show off unless you got it. You know, if you got it, do it. If you don't have it, don't try to do it. Don't try to do more than your band can handle. But the most important question I have when I hear the march when I'm adjudicating is, okay, does this band sound good? Is, is this something I'm enjoying listening to, the sonority of the band? Marches have to have consistent pulse. There can't be a variation of the, of the, of the time. Vertical precision, the vertical precision and the space behind the notes often define the mark style that you're going at. Harmonic accompaniment, what is that? Bump, 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 bump in the horn section. Oompa, 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 that's harmonic accompaniment. If, the, if, if I see it on the score, I, I learned this from one of my mentors in Alabama. If I see it on the score, I gotta hear it with my ears. So oftentimes I judge a band that's playing a march with offbeats and I can't hear them. You got two horns up there, and I can't hear the offbeat. So you're going to have to double that harmonic accompaniment to make it happen. Obvious dynamic contrast, obvious styles. On the other side of that slide, be careful of six eight marches. Okay, if your band has not been schooled in six eight frequently over you know over the fall of the previous couple of years, then MPA march is not the time to learn how to do six eight for MPA. I've heard that, well, I just want to challenge my kids. Right, but that's that's a bridge too far if you're not grounded in 6-8. So be just beware of that. 6-8 quickly turns into dotted 8 16 and 2-4 and two, and two, time very quickly. King marches, Phil marches, Fillmore marches, Susan marches, all similar, but there's a, there's a distinct sound to a King march. There's a distinct sound to a Fillmore march, and, and Susa certainly is <coughs> precisely vertical but also these beautiful horizontal melodies and counter lines. So be careful that concert marches are pretty much like a concert overture sometimes, um, and they can be lengthy. The, the British march versus the American march, two distinctly different styles. So if you're going to do the British, again, that's something you need to have done on a couple of concerts, and you have some models, because the British march can, or European marches, can throw you off if you're thinking, you know, Fillmore and you're thinking, you know, a nice European march or something, that's going to throw you off. So make sure you just understand the genre. The point of the warm-up march is to make the band sound good, shut the judge's mouth, make me put my pencil down, and get me in the mood to give you a superior. That's the point of the warm-up march. Okay, before we leave the march, okay. um, we had a question okay, uh, typed in. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> and the question was, with a, a small middle school uh, band, mm -hmm. would you double or would you send a third clarinet 
to double a third trumpet part. Um, my suggestion would be, or my, my immediate response would be no. Okay, and I, I hate to say that, not knowing you, not knowing your kids, and really not knowing your situation, but if you have 16 kids in the middle school band, I know there are middle school marches out there that would be appropriate that have two trumpet parts. So if you have two trumpet players, play something with two parts. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the rest of your instrumentation is like, but since about a third of the band can be clarinets and you need a lot of clarinets to get that sound, the sonority mm -hmm. that you want, that would be my concern about moving a clarinet to a third trumpet part. I would say examine the literature a little bit more. I know you can find a, a, a quality middle school march that has just two middle school pieces and if you don't, or, or two trumpet parts. And if you don't own it, see if you can borrow a couple things to read. And I, and I know that can be a drag, you know, we're talking about literature and if you have four pieces in your library, you're limited, reach out to your district. Yeah, there are some uh, pieces published in four parts, what they call flex instrumentation. So, so take a look at some of those. Those are usually notated on the publisher's, uh, you know, uh, websites and things like that. Awesome. For the for the doubling, if you had to double at something, if you just had to, maybe see if the sax could do it if it was in the range. You know, yeah, that's, I, that's I, a, we, yeah, we that's best not, we can do on that one. Yeah, we try to do. We don't. Thank you for asking. Okay, so the second selection is typically more lyrical and more more sub, subdued. You can only hide so much, so you know. Keep it. If you, if you got some weaknesses, find things that are thicker scored, um, such as that. You can sometimes cross cue some things. Um, if you've got, um, you know, a weakness, um, then maybe you could write a couple of parts in another section, as long as it maintains something close to the timbre and color that's intended. But try to stick to the score as much as possible. Look for look for thick scoring. Look for something that is not going to be a finale piece that's going to be, you know, contrasting with your march. And then the third se selection is your finale piece. And my, my feeling about it is the last two minutes of your final piece has got to be the absolute best your band has to offer, as, the, as does the march. You know, the, the two bookends have got to be solid if you're going to, if you're going to get that superior at the end of the day. But pick pick a piece that sounds like a finale. It's going to give me, you know, yes, band, yes, sonority, yes, excitement, yes, fun, those kind of emotional things. And just be careful that you keep your selections, you know, five to eight minutes. Again, with, with limited ensembles and instrumentation, the shorter the better. You know, and there's lots of good pieces that are short, or than some of the others. If you if you got it, then go ahead and play your 10-minute piece and you know, go, go for it. That's great. So I know we've talked about a lot. So here we are. And when Jim and I were planning this session, you know, he, he came back here a lot. So right now you, you, you've thought about it. You have, let's say you have in your folder five tunes. You're only going to play three for MPA. So now what? more more director preparation and we've already touched on this all this stuff is is interconnected um, internalize the music and what i mean by that is that you need to begin to make an, an emotional connection to the music you begin need to begin um imaginating how if it's if it's more of a functional piece teaching piece how can can you make it more interesting for the kids and more interesting for the listener, more interesting for yourself too, you know, to be creative, but internalize the music. And well, obviously you're gonna study the score. You're gonna understand the form of the piece, the keys, you know, what stylistic interpretations are required for that piece to, to happen, excuse me. <clears throat> and um, become familiar with that. Listen to some, listen to some recordings. Um, mark your scores uh, highlight the melody all kinds of there's lots of stuff out there about how to mark scores and things but you got to do the the, the 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 brain work that it takes to understand the music decide what you want that piece to sound like can you hear it in your head you know uh, get the metronome out and you know conduct along and just see what the see what tempos actually work you don't always have to do if it says 120 you don't exactly have to do 120. 
uh, as a judge, I'm not going to sit there with the, with the, the metronome and tap out, oh my gosh, I'm dinging you for it was 119. You know, you don't want to be all over the place, but 120 can sound just as good at 116 if you capture the interpretation of the piece. Likewise, a piece that's going quarter note at 150, that'll probably be okay at 142, you know, 138, something like that. Um, just, you know, don't worry as much about tempo as long as it retains the character of the music. Um, sometimes you take recordings and, you know, you just look at the score and listen to it and listen to it and listen to it. Maybe uh, you've got some piano skills, play the melody on, on the piano, play it on your horn. Um, what, are your, what are your conducting responses going to be? Okay, how are you going to convey what you want? How are you going to convey the will of the conductor just to, to make this beautiful shaped phrase happen? So what are you going to show your kids? And sometimes you do have to practice your conducting responses. Make good musical decisions. It says common practice. Be very careful if you're going to take a, a classic from the band repertoire and monkey with the interpretation too much, especially MPA, because some people have their favorite pieces. Okay, like I'll give you a personal example. I love the whole suites, E flat and F. And I have my way of doing them. And the, you know, that's what I want to hear, even though that's not my job as adjudicator to hear what I want to hear. I have to really watch myself when I'm judging a classic or something that's that's you know has a standard interpretation like Susan Marches, for example, is another one. I don't want a Susan March to have a feel more tempo, you know, those kind of things. So understand the common practice of performance for those particular pieces. Um, before we go, actually, as we go to the next slide, um, somebody uh, chimed in a question about the timing suggestions. Mm -hmm. And the question was, are they the five to eight minute finale? Was that a high school recommendation? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes. You can probably, for many, many situations, do an entire middle school program in five to eight minutes. But so, you know. Same principle. But right. I mean, right. You know, your five yeah. minute overture for high school needs to be two and a half or three for middle school. So you might want to think of cutting those things in half or by two thirds or something. Great right. question. I did. Yeah. I, you know, I apologize for not thinking that totally through here in the conversation. OK, so musical decisions. This is one that I see that's biting bands all over the place. I, I frequently do rehearsals leading into MPAs for other people now being retired. But I also remember being guilty of this at, at Bureau Beach. Um, and that is putting off some decisions till later, okay? Um, certainly, you know, you start with your with rehearsal and performance tempos, you start with style and interpretation, Phrasing, where are we going to breathe? That's that's really one that I see really messed up. The, the kids don't know where to breathe. They don't know when to breathe. They don't know if it's a staggered phrase. We don't want to hear the bar line, or do we want to hear the bar line? Exactly how that's going to happen. Dynamic pacing. You have those pieces that have those long crescendos or decrescendos, okay? Or you you have these these pieces that go from uh, you know mezzo piano to piano, to mezzo forte, to forte over a long period of time. And those, those are the, the, the terrace dynamics. That has to be paced. You can't, you know, you've got to make your, your floor and your ceiling, you know, if, you, if your floor is here for mezzo, your floor and ceiling is here, if you can see that for mezzo forte, then forte, the floor and ceiling is here. You know, it's, it's practically double that volume. So make sure your pacing is right. Now, that being said, you can never sacrifice the quality of your ensemble to play a mezzo piano or a piano or a pianissimo or to play, you know, one F or two Fs or three Fs or four Fs. I think we had a question come up about what do I do about, about three, three Fs or four Fs, and we'll address that later. But that, and make sure, you know, you've got a Rollin Tondo. Exactly what, how's that going to feel to the kids? You know, and again, back to conducting decisions. In the moment. Sometimes you get inspired. You start to get the, you know, get you, you start feeling the 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 karma of the music, the spirit of the music, and you go, you know what, that should go a little faster. Let's take that just a little faster, you know. Um, and phrasing, and I, by, by that I mean shaping. Sometimes I just we're, we're we're conducting along the performance, and you know what, I just right now I want more. Let's go. I always tried to get my students to understand. 
they're going to find out what I'm going to do at the time of performance. Okay, and and I say that's that that's that's tempered with good judgment. You're obviously not going to do something crazy, but I might decide to play a phrase faster than I have before, or I might take longer on the raw entendre. So those are things as you internalize the music along with the kids, you're going to start making decisions in the moment, and I encourage those. That's that's what music making is about: is being an artistic decision maker in the moment. All right, so we, we've talked about a lot of preparation up to this, you know, concert performance. Um, I'm not so old that I don't remember being that young band director and being like, what's the score going to be when I'm done? Because I would start and my probably one and only assessment was what happened on stage. So <clears throat> of all these things, as Jim said before, this is circular, it's cyclical that the more evaluating you do in your band room on your own or with a guided friend or with a mentor, um, the better you will have, the better idea you'll have of what's gonna happen on MPA day. That's part of it. But this is a concert performance. You know, we're training young musicians. I understand why we're all stressed, but what do we want the concert performance it to be? How, how do we wanna prepare for that? So when we get there, it's not a surprise. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna leave people to read that for the most part. And I'm gonna cherry pick a couple of points that I think are, are in, these are all important, but I will say, ha hear your kids individually and in small voice groups as often as you can. That way you know frequently what's going on in those sections. Okay, all those other things, part checkoffs, great. You have the section leaders check something off, have them coach, record the band, get get some people in to rehearse the band. You know, but but the right the the the, the right hand side is important to in the moment listening. Another thing that I hear from people is, well, Jim, I'm I'm I can't believe the kids sounded that bad today. I taught that last month. Yeah, did you review it? Did you assess it? And I and I, I got that from right here from Dr. Croco about. You know, going back and assessing because they forget or they they start to leave part of it out you know they they remember the most important things but the the critical little details that'll wreck your rating they forget and so constantly go back and recheck things that you think you've taught did you sure you taught it i'm sure we're all great teachers did they learn it how do you know that they learned it and that's truly really what assessing is about and then all those other other things but I also believe strongly in regular regular recordings and getting third parties who don't have a dog in the hunt, so to speak, to come in and and and, and do the band. Um, my my colleagues up at up at Vero uh, a few weeks ago had a, a trusted colleague from out of the county come in and spend a day rehearsing the band for the point of assessing what they hear. So that's a good idea if you can get a colleague to come in and just run a rehearsal. They, they can give you some pointers, but guess what? That frees you from podium deafness and blindness, and you can sit in the back of the room and you're gonna go, yeah, I cannot believe I, I hadn't heard that. You know, so those will those will help you stay on the, the, the straight and narrow heading heading towards the you know the final final product. Okay. And so then <clears throat> finally, um, when MPA Day has arrived, you know, we call this you know, MPA Day 101. One of my mentors always said to me, especially me, because I have a little bit of energy, he's like, Casey, on MPA day, you just have to operate in super slow-mo. Because if I have that nervous energy, my kids are gonna have that nervous energy. So me operating in super slow-mo is just like maybe being a normal person. So, you know, think about that. But what really helped me to do that is to have my list of what's gonna happen on that day. The younger my kids were, the more we practiced, you know, and especially if I was in a district for, you know, several years, this is the side we're gonna come on. So everybody's gonna line up in the hallway. We're gonna practice getting in here just so they're not nervous, okay? I always want my kids, we use the term concert, concert, concert. We're gonna go have our concert. We're gonna go have our concert. And we would talk to them about the difference between mom and pop and a learned audience. That was the only difference. 
What we did was exactly the same. It was the audience that was different. Okay, so I just prepare them the best I can. You know, get your forms done, get all that stuff done. That's in your, you know, cave of solitude time. What do I need to do? Consider the time of day you are performing. Are your kids gonna be hungry? Okay, are they performing at, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon and they're high school kids who got there at 640 in the morning? What's that going to be like? Think about those things so you can, you know, prepare before. You know, what's the student emergency kit? Okay, I think that kit gets smaller and smaller the older your kids get. Okay, as a middle school band director, my kit was this big. As a high school band director, I don't know how it was big because they took care of each other. And that's how that went. But as the band director, you know, do I have extra scores? Okay, do I have a repair kit that I need that I'm not gonna let my kids do? Make that list for you. What does that mean for you? Do you need two coffees on that day? Do you need a bigger lunch? Do you need less lunch? You know, think about that. And then finally, the thing is to remember again that this is a concert. What do you want your students to get out of this experience? Do you want this to be something that terrifies them or do you want them coming off the stage feeling connected to you connected to the people that they were making music with, because as Jim was saying before, making those decisions in the moment that we're making music together. What do you want them to get out of this as humans? Okay, we talk so much about music making as a part of the human aesthetic experience. It's kind of hard to remember when we're beating notes and rhythms into them for eight weeks. So how do we want to set them up so we have them enjoying this as humans? Do you want to enjoy this program with them? How well are you prepared? All this stuff leads up to this moment, that it's a music making moment that we can live with our kids and that we can share with the audience. So set everybody up for the most success. Um, that almost brings us to the end here. Um, oh, wait. So yeah, there, there's more, that's the link again, in case you didn't get it. Um, we had one question sent to us um, ahead of time, and it was on Chant and Jubilo uh, by Francis Macbeth. I hope some of these questions were answered during this time. So the first question was, <coughs> how would you work on getting the best characteristic sound from the brass section? So at this stage of the game, that's a great question. I don't see that as related specifically towards that piece of music that has to happen all the time. Um, Jim and I are both trumpet players. I was surprised we weren't nudging each other <laughs> in front of the, the camera the whole time. True. But well, you know, what what are the physical requirements of you know playing a brass instrument? Air quality, okay. Air quality and air quantity. Do they have an embouchure that can support good air? Okay. Are their teeth open? And maybe check mouthpiece sizes. When I would be in, um, even as a middle school <coughs> band director, all my kids started on five C's. I tried to have them on three C's by the time they left eighth grade. You know, again, trumpet play, there's always a magic mouthpiece out there. But I'd be surprised sometimes when I was a high school band director, I have my kids come with, you know, 10 and a quarter mouthpieces. I wonder, I couldn't understand why their sound was so bright until I start looking at those mouthpieces. You know, what are their musicianship skills for your brass players? Can they hold a pitch steady? Okay, that's what I would be doing for a brass player sound, because if they can't hold a pitch steady, they can't bend it into tune either. Check, check also on things like that, the position of the tongue. Sometimes the tongue is in weird configurations and that will um, make the sound more, more stuffy and, and less pure. You're looking for a very pure sound. Um, we, we left that one off of there. What's the best way to work on intonation? Well, same as above. Intonation starts with quality air, proper embouchure, proper posture, proper holding position. Everything affects everything. You know, I have a checklist that starts with, okay, how, how are we going to sit in band? Or as we go back to, I think I got this from um, Alfred Watkins Clinic once, or something like, we go back to the beginning band every day, okay? Even if I'm in the 12th grade, how do I sit? How do I hold? How do I breathe? What's my band face look like, et cetera? So just run a checklist of that stuff. And then, you know, the best way to, to hold a pitch steady is a steady air, but you, you listen to something that's a drone, get it, get it off of a keyboard is a good way to do it, or you know, off of a device and just sit there and try to match that drone sound. 
try to pull, you know, get rid of the beets and pull it in there. So dwelling is, is the word I wanted to say. Okay, and um, something that I put down here uh, that again, with developing musicians especially, but sometimes with our bigger kids, <clears throat> we'd be a little afraid of. Um, for intonation, sometimes our, our musicians aren't playing in tune because they don't know what in tune and out of tune sound like. For me, I think trombones are the best instruments to demonstrate this with, because I can operate both slides, you know, at the mm -hmm. same time. Exactly. But you have to spend some time. I think example, non-example is the best way to do this. Have them identify what out of sound sounds like. And you can't just say, is it in tune or out of tune? Say, what are you hearing that makes it sound out of tune? Mm -hmm. I'm hearing vibrations. I'm hearing squishy. It doesn't matter what they call it. You know, it sounds like spaghetti to me. Great. Now it's in tune. What does it sound like to you now? You tell I'm getting a little hungry. <laughs> you know, it sounds like, you know, a breadstick now. Okay, great. So when you hear breadsticks, it's in tune. When you hear spaghetti, it's out of tune. That I don't think sometimes because we hear it so well or we struggle with and we want to fix it so much that we're not taking the time we need to develop their skills on that grade one and two music when it's tertiary harmony. Because once they start getting those you know, stacked and compacted chords, they can't, it's harder to play in tune because it's so complex. So take the time in those warm up exercises, in those unison studies to teach in tune and out of tune and just don't say that's not in tune. You don't have to, I, folks, I'm gonna tell you as a young musician and maybe even not so young, I couldn't tell if it was sharp or flat. I could tell if it was out. Okay, mm -hmm. make an adjustment. Band, when they're in tune, raise your hand. Okay, and then the goalists are getting it there faster. Okay, so I think that's a real important question for lots of things, but I think that example, non-example is, yeah. is a good one. Um, what would be the key areas to listen for in brass sections? Well, all of the above. You know, I mean, I want to hear, I want to, first and foremost, I want to hear a pure brass sound. If it's, if it's a brass feature in a piece, like a fanfare, I want the purity of the sound. I want the directionalism of the trumpet and the trombone. It, 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 as an adjudicator, that's what I'm listening for. And if we have the horns, you know, masked by the music stand, it, it takes the edge off the brilliance of a trumpet. You know, it, same thing with a trombone. If we're playing down on the floor or we're playing through all these bodies, I, I want that sound coming straight out, you know, with, in, its, in its purity. Um, okay, they, Jim mentioned this before, but go to that FBA sheet. Yes. Start, just start on that criteria. The nice thing is with, uh, with you know, the Florida Bandmasters Association, not only do they tell you the criteria and they put it on a rubric, Okay, so they, they tell you on the rubric, this is where you are. Mm -hmm. Just start going down from left to right. You know, fundamentals, technical, then musical. All right, because if box one isn't here, you're wasting your time in box two and you can't even see box three. Okay, so really start, you know, with all of your sounds, but this, certainly with This brass. is a little bit off the question, but it, it, it isn't in a sense. What does he say, as an adjudicator, the, the area of the sheets that I find that cause me to lower ratings, less than superior, or they cause me to want to give that superior, obviously the first box with the tonal things, that's, that's a given. But the middle of the second box on the, on, the, on the judge's sheet, and then the third box, which deals with all of the expressions, move the emphasis in that third box. It's not in the third box because it's the third least important. Those things are, are you know, you can move it around, but you've got to address it and don't wait too late to do your third box things. If you don't understand some terminology, look, I, I've stumped some people, I've stumped myself. What's the difference between balance and blend? That's a tough question. You know, what's the difference between, you know, articulation and interpretive articulation and style? Those are tough questions. If you don't know, that's what the mentoring thing's right. about. Call us up and let's have a discussion about that. And we, you know, we don't know everything, but we know we know enough to to, to get you moving to the to uh, along, and then you can find somebody who knows more than we do. Yeah. Um, it's it's a part of being old. Okay, yeah. you get to learn stuff when you're you, and you right. make it to being old. Right. Um, the the musical effect box, that third box. Practice those things in your scales. Practice those things in your rhythmic Precisely. studies. 
you know, right. practice those things on stuff that they know and they can do really, really well. Um, you know, line 17 from the book or whatever you're using as, you know, your, your choral warm up and say, remember how we did it now in the warm up, right? Getting that sound. Now let's transfer it. And that's what, you know, Jim was referring to, but don't wait too late. Don't say, well, we can't practice phrasing yet because they don't know the notes enough. Sure, practice phrasing in your scales. Okay, and then the dynamics one, I think, Jim, you answered this just a few yeah, seconds it's, ago. It's relative. You know, don't worry about how many fortes it is or four, four pianos and that kind of stuff. You, you just got to pace it, find your floor and your ceiling and show us that you understand the basic levels between. You know, if you've got some piece that's overly marked with stuff like that, Maybe that's not one you want to do on MPA unless you've got a really strong ensemble that truly understands nuance and the subtleties of, of playing with nuance. Okay, awesome. Well, um, we are at our the end of our time here. Um, we've been asked if this is going to go on the web. And my apologies, Josh Bula, who is our technical guru uh, for the Florida Music Educators Association. He hooked us all up with getting this done. He's going to get it onto the mentoring page um, as soon as he can. I don't know if that's, you know, hours, days, weeks, or months. I'm sure it's not months, but uh, I'm sure it probably won't be there by eight o'clock. But he'll get that onto the mentoring page for us. Um, Mr. Sammons has very graciously agreed to share his contact information with you. You know, that's all uh, right here. My information is on the um, FBA homepage somewhere i'm in a standing committee or ad hoc committee i don't know what they call it but you know it's there uh please you know reach out um go ahead. and i will definitely if you will contact me i will definitely get back with you i'm very interested in passing on things that were passed on to me by some of the the best band directors ever has been i was very lucky to have many mentors and many sources so all, all this stuff that that we know we just learned it from somebody else who knew more than we did and i'm happy to pass on what what i can uh but you, know, you can check out who i am if you don't know me on the website and you'll see a lot of experience from teaching fourth grade band out in the country to you know my, my last years in vero so i've got a lot of lot of experience uh and some knowledge and, and if i don't know i'll get you to somebody that does Thank you very much for taking your time, you know, to be here. Uh, review this as much as you need to. Uh, a little commercial for me. I'm presenting about intention with all of this kind of stuff, basically on assessment um, and intention in your instructional practice at FMEA. I think it's Thursday at three o'clock, um, but I hope to see you there. And thanks for coming tonight. I hope you can see us. Bye-bye. Thank you for setting us. Thank thanks you, Mr. Simons. I appreciate welcome. it. My pleasure. Okay.